welcome back. Um, in the past, I always did some PVC parts, a uh, recurring job on the shaper uh, that needed 30 degree regrooves in it. And I used this 30 degree tool bit for this job. Always worked perfectly fine. But I sold the shaper and um, I need another solution to do this part. So the most obvious thing would be to use a 30 degree uh, uh, V-groove end mill or a single lip cutter. I tried that on the engraving machine with or on the CNC router and it kind of works but it's not great because uh, a v-groove bit has always the problem that you have zero cutting speed on the extreme end of the tip that for therefore the finish on the bottom is pretty poor so next best thing would be to use a a wheel cover that has 30 degree included angle on the tip um, i couldn't find one to buy um, a standard high-speed steel uh, cutter with uh, 30 degrees is not available off the shelf. Something like this with 30 degrees. I couldn't find it and having one reground would be quite expensive. And regrinding one myself is not in the realm of possibility right now because um, I'm not set up for tool and cutter grinding at the moment. <laughs> My the cutter grinder I bought is still on a pallet somewhere on a truck, I guess. So I was thinking I could build a indexable wheel cutter that uses carbide inserts. And unfortunately you cannot get uh, carbide inserts with 30 degrees included angle. You can get them with 35 degree included angle. This is a, a VCMT insert. Uh, VCMT uh, 1103. And as I said, 35 degree included angle. But fortunately, I have a surface grinder and I can regrind these to 30 degrees with seven degrees of clearance. That's not a problem at all. I can do that. Um, I just went on eBay and bought a package of Sandwick uh, VCMT inserts that were cheap um, with, with a 0.4 millimeter radius on the, on the cutting edge. And I'm going to regrind these to 30 degrees. And also touch off the, the top surface so I get rid of the, the heavy chip breaker that's in this style of, of uh, insert. We're only cutting uh, PVC here so we don't need that. And then I'm going to machine this wheel cutter um, 70, 67 millimeter OD and only 8 millimeter thick. Out of, out of this piece of tool steel. This is a, a chunk of O2 that I had sitting on my shelf. This is uh, slightly oversized. This is uh, 76 millimeter. Okay, I, I machined both faces parallel to each other. I bored it to 16 millimeter, slightly oversized. So it's a nice sliding fit on the arbor. And I chamfered it. I left the thickness a little bit heavy because I want to surface grind it to final thickness. Uh, next step will be to cut the keyway. We'll do that over on the milling machine. Centering the part in the vise of the milling machine using a dial test indicator. Always my preferred method over a coax, coax style indicator. Uh, this is faster, more accurate and doesn't need as much uh, C height. So always my preferred method. And you can use it to center a workpiece, a square workpiece, or pick up an edge. So uh, definitely my preferred method. Especially if you have something like this holder that clamps around your spindle nose. So we're using a neck down. That means that the shank is relieved 
is more, smaller than the cutting diameter of the end mill. A necked down 3mm carbide end mill 3 fluid. And um, I will be, be stepping down in 1mm increments, just slot it, do a full slotting cut inwards, then do a finishing pass all the way around. And there is the keyway. Um, obviously, you have to go deeper by the radius of your tool. So I had to go in 0 0.5, 0 0.15 millimeters deeper than a regular keyway would need. Um, you can do that if there is enough room on your part and the wall thicknesses are, are big enough. Then you can get away with cutting a keyway uh, with an end mill. As you can see, it's a decent fit. Goes nicely over the 4mm key on a 60mm arbor. Uh, next I will surface grind it to thickness. Ground the part to thickness um, using the, the kind of rotary grind method where you spin the part uh, on the magnet after each pass because I prefer this, um, uh, this grinding pattern on a circular part over just going straight over it. Um, going straight over it always looks a bit, uh, <laughs> almost a bit lazy, um, but I, I kind of dig this finish. So. I put the, the blank for the cutter on this, this mill arbor, just with a few spacer rings, a key, and the cutter blank, a few more spacer rings, and the screw. Tighten it down. Shouldn't need a whole lot of torque because we have a key in there. But better be safe than sorry in this case because this blank will stay on this arbor now until it's completely finished. I will do all the turning, all the milling, everything while the part is on this arbor. So let's go to the lathe, put this in the 5C chuck and we're good to go. Speaking of 5C chuck, this is a 5C to Morse Taper 2 adapter and I find this highly useful because I have so much Morse Taper 2 shanked stuff. Uh, collets and the arbors and ER16 chucks and whatnot. And it's often nice to hold Morse Taper 2 tooling, especially when used for work holding, um, either in the lathe or on the dividing head or on the rotary table or whatever. Uh, in a 5C uh, connection. So these these more steeper uh, adapters you just do it like this and you have an awful lot of overhang um, which I don't like. Don't, doesn't. I will change over to this arbor because it's it's about 15 millimeter shorter so um, I will rearrange that and then put it in this adapter and the screw will go in from the back and hold the Morse taper in the adapter. Okay, I regrouped, put it in the adapter. The screw is back here. Uh, now I can use my, my, my 5C wrench and an Elm wrench to tighten it down. And we're good to go. It's still a lot of overhang and we're probably not being able to take a heavy cut on this. But that way I can keep uh, concentricity and my angular index during all the operations. Turn down the OD 
and uh, chamfered the edges so I do not cut myself. Setup was not super uh, rigid as you would expect. The overhang from the 5C adapter, then the small diameter shank of the Morse taper 2 tooling, then the overhang from the Morse taper shank and the large diameter out here. That doesn't uh, that doesn't make it a, a very <laughs> rigid, rigid setup. In fact, for roughing, I, I put a little center drill into the screw of the arbor here and supported it with the tailstock, and that was a, a very rigid setup. Okay, I set the part up on the rotary table now, and we're going to cut the profile that you can see when you look from the top down on the part. That means we're cutting uh, this, this radius and this angled uh, line here to give us this, uh, this tri, tri star whatever thing shaped. Um, we'll start just by poking in that 6mm hole that will form the corner radius here. I, I mapped out the, the coordinates in CAD, 15.51 uh, over and 3 mm up from center. We'll drill that three times by spinning the rotary table. Then I will cut the tangents and uh, go from there. Okay, I have the part on the arbor uh, in the rotary table. The rotary table is centered to the, uh, to the mill serve out the DRO and now I'm going to poke in these three holes. go, change over to a drill bit and this is tool steel so we're using a little bit of coolant. So I'm using a 4mm carbide end mill to saw out the segments, uh, just taking a full depth 8mm deep slotting cut at 1000 rpm, uh, feeding relatively slow but still creating a proper chip, not dust, and works quite well. Um, the setup is more solid than I expected. Uh, I get a little bit of chatter but this is not a new end mill so meh. There we go. Um, this is probably one, one of the last operations this end mill will do in its life. Um, I can hear that it's getting, getting dull. Which is okay because that's why we have end mills, to use them. <laughs> so, cut out the rectangular section and... Uh, next I will have to trim off uh, these corners here. I need these corners for clearance so I can come down with an end mill and machine the actual insert pocket. Uh, here, here, and here. These relief cuts are always parallel to the surface next to them. So it's parallel, parallel, and uh, parallel. That means that we can just Keep the setup, keep our angle set up, move over, uh, don't crash into the setup, step over the correct amount like this and saw off this part here too.
Okay, now I'm cleaning up the roughed out surfaces with a 6mm three fluid carbide end mill. Just going down, take a pre finished pass, step over 0.2mm and do a climb, uh, climb milling finishing pass. I flipped the rotary table around 90 degrees in, into vertical position and I'm using a 2mm carbide end mill to cut the relief slot into the center of the uh, insert pocket, what will later be the insert pocket. Uh, already did the first one running at 3000 rpm and stepping down 0.5mm doing full slotting cut. There we go. Okay, I'm just whacking away the front material uh, of the pocket seat because I do not want to cut that away when I machine the actual pocket seat. This is just a relief cut or a roughing cut for that matter. I just tapped the M 2.5mm threads for the insert screws and now I will take the whole rotary table off the mill and put it over on the engraving machine and then we will cut the insert pocket. Over on the CNC I'm cutting a template for the 35 degree insert pocket so I can machine them on the pentagraph machine. Uh, Using a dial test indicator to center my part, my spindle over the part. This is a piece of tail and this is my this is another template that I made before and I'm reusing the back side. Uh, doesn't really matter. <laughs> So I'm over at the pentagraph machine, set the rotary table completely with the workpiece on the table of the engraver and I'm cutting the insert pockets. I already did two of them, came out good. Uh, the VCMT insert fits nicely in there, uh, orientation is correct and uh, also the position of the screw hole matches with the insert pocket. Um, you generally want the screw hole a little bit 
offset to the hole in the insert. You want it in a way that the screw with the tapered head pulls the insert back into the insert pocket. So you get a nice and solid register. So let's rotate the rotary table around the next insert pocket here. And we're good to go. For roughing I will drop the table by uh, 0.05 millimeters just in case uh, vibrations want to damage the bottom of the mill surface. And when you, <laughs> when you run a pantograph or a duplicate or a tracer mill, there are vibrations. <laughs> uh, it's just a matter of fact, especially on a relatively lightweight machine like this one. Um, this was sold by Deckel as a uh, Panograph engraver and light duty 2D copy mill. Okay, here we are at the template table, and you can see the Delrin template with the 35 degree V that we did on the CNC router. And the stylus rides in this channel or slot and just follows it to create uh, a shape we were after. The single hole here in the center, this is for alignment purposes. Um, I can put the stylus in here, the pantograph is then fixed in, in the center line of this uh, geometry and I can use an indicator to center my part under the spindle of the engraver. Um, when you design templates for an engraver, uh, always, 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 always include some mean of centering the stylus. Uh, relative to the geometry that you want to machine. Otherwise, you have a hell of a time to align things to each other. As, as engravers and pantograph machines get more and more um, wiped away by CNC machines, or basically they have been wiped away because nobody in, who, who is right in his mind uses a pantograph to make money anymore, um, with all the pantograph machines and all the old timers gone who knew how to run and set up a pantograph uh, machine, it's quite hard to get information how to design something like this properly and use it. So um, I had to come up with a lot of this myself and learn it just uh, <laughs> by painful experience. The way I'm going to do this, the stylus will all, and the, the, the spindle will always do this motion, this V motion here. And I'm just going to feed incrementally in in this direction, about 0.2 millimeters each pass, which is quite a decent uh, side engagement for a 2 millimeter carbide MML. Um, until we hit our dimension, um, I'm moving the XY table of the mill to, to move in. This is better than stepping down uh, because we're not wearing out the end of the end mill as bad. Um, this is basically manual adaptive machining <laughs> or uh, manual trochoidal machining. Spindle is set up for about 10,000 RPM I think in this configuration. There we go. Um, hope this wasn't too shaky, but that looks that looks pretty good. Uh, insert fits, seats nicely. Um, 
as I'm doing all in basically one setup on the rotary table, I'm not losing my register in the angular and uh, uh, run out wise uh, orientation. So that's pretty decent. Um, quite happy with that. I think I can take it off the rotary now and do the final steps on the lathe, meaning uh, chopping off these edges. So one of the last steps is to create the 30 degree uh, tapered shape and I'm definitely not going to put the compound slide on the lathe for just a, a clearance taper. So I swung my tool around in the, in the tool holder uh, like this, 15 degree off axis and I'm just uh, blending the taper uh, in, into each other by taking uh, incremental depth cuts. You will see. That looks pretty good. I'm not going to bother to uh, clean up the, the taper all the way back. Um, I, I will have it end in the step here. That's be, that doesn't matter because the insert is only cutting um, to a depth of 10 millimeters or 9.5 something I think. Uh, but this looks pretty good and yeah as you saw this is a technique to cut uh, uh, steep tapers without having a, a compound on the lathe. You can cut uh, shallow tapers, the same technique of course, but you have to be very careful not to get of course that way. So I'm grinding the inserts to 30 degrees included angle plus uh, the back relief. And I do that, I have two and a half degree of angle blocks stacked and super glued to my small grinding vise here. That creates the 30 degrees because 35 minus 30 is 5, half of 5 is 2.5 degrees. So I had to tip it to 2.5 degrees. And I tilted the vise a few degrees uh, that way to create the back rake or the clearance angle to the back. And I'm just going to hit the top of the surface grinder until I blend into the radius. Set up on the surface grinder. I ground the first insert already on one side. This is just a D125 uh, diamond wheel. Uh, it's not super fine. I normally use this for my precision ground flat stones, not for grinding carbide, but it works decent. Uh, let's drop in another insert. And of course I'm running the dust extraction because carbide dust kills you. And there we go. I'm just blending the ground surface into the, the nose radius of the insert, just nicking the coating there. Now I have to uh, set this uh, setup up in another way to grind the other side and we're good to go. Grinding the top of the inserts down, uh, I have just a piece of, of tool steel here. I tapped the M2 thread in it which is a screw smaller than the standard, standard insert screw. And I, I hold the insert down with a, with a single uh, countersunk screw. And 
And I do this because the head on the screw is smaller and falls into the falls into the counter countersink on the insert and I do not grind steel with my diamond wheel. And that's a very easy setup. Uh, just just screw the insert down. and hit it with the wheel until all the chip breaker is gone. Preferable all the inserts to the same height. I deburred the cutter completely, I cold blued it to give it some appearance. Here are the three inserts and the insert screws. Uh, I think all that's left is to try it out. <laughs> and before you ask, this is what I'm using for cold bluing. Um, activator and the, the cold blue itself. But in my mind, um, all the stuff is the same. Uh, you have all this uh, selenium uh, dioxide based uh, cold bluing and this is some acidic solution I guess. Okay, inserts mounted. Looks quite decent. Um, I like it. Looks, looks, almost, looks almost professional uh, made. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's put it on the mill and hope that, is, that it doesn't fly apart. I found a combination of speed and feet that works very well. It gives me a good finish. And yeah, let's, let's do a couple of test cuts. I'm running it at 300 RPM and I'm feeding about 200 millimeters per minute. Uh, that's about uh, uh, 8 inches per minute, I guess. Something like that. Works better if you engage the gear. Okay, as you saw, uh, very uneventful, cutter runs very smooth. Um, only thing I get here is this, uh, this hairline burr on the upper e uh, edge, but that's not a problem. Uh, that goes away with a razor blade in one swipe, or just with a nail. Looks pretty decent to me. Uh, this was 8.5 mm deep uh, conventional milling pass. Now we'll try to go back uh, an additional 0.5 mm deep climb cutting if that improves the finish. I have to go back when I mill the uh, actual parts, I have to go back anyway, and then a, a climb cutting pass wouldn't hurt me. Okay, that's not good. Um, the climb cutting path leaves a very fuzzy, ugly finish. I kind of expected that uh, going, going with, with the soft material. Soft materials generally cut better uh, conventional milling, especially something like rubber or even PVC. This time I'm going the full 9mm depth. Okay, the upper one is uh, climb cutting and the lower one is conventional milling. And as you can see, the, the conventional cut is, is way, way, way better. I, I think if I would run it with coolant or the, uh, the fog buster, 
It would even improve more. Um, seems to work. Uh, now I have only to make a fixture so I can machine these 200 millimeter long parts above the Weiss uh, completely in one setup. So, um, yeah, I ground one set of inserts and generally in PVC if I don't crash these inserts into a setup or a fixture uh, they will basically last forever. Um, PVC has no abrasive tendencies, um, doesn't dull any tools, uh, just, it just moves out of the way of the cutter. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's not a problem to machine. Only thing when you, uh, heat, when the PVC gets too hot, it releases a uh, muriatic um, acid. That tends to uh, <laughs> that's bad for you and also makes stuff rust. So do not uh, overheat PVC. Uh, be a bit careful and do not burn it in your stove. I hope you don't burn any plastic in your stove. So hope you enjoyed. Thank you all for watching and see you next time.